many of you just love that this Advent season is here? How many of you just love Christmas time? I do. I do. Yeah, we can celebrate. I feel like people just get nicer this time of the year, except in the mall parking lot. There's South Pole elves there. I just got to warn you, right? Traffic gets a little crazy in Lake Woodlands. But um, listen, I, I want to kind of open with just a confession, a missed opportunity. I missed something. Have you ever just, uh, have you ever just like seen something and, and gone, oh, wow, I, I wish I'd seen that earlier. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't a, a Black Friday deal. Nothing like that, I just, Thanksgiving had come and, and gone, and um, I follow like, Christine Kane. I, I don't know if you know who Christine Kane is. You, I'm so thankful for her voice in the world. But she posted this on Instagram on Friday after Thanksgiving. This is, she said, be sure to bring up politics at Thanksgiving dinner. It's going to save you money on Christmas gifts. That total missed opportunity. So I don't know if you were like, our family, I just kind of like, let's not even, let's not even go there. But um, I hope your Thanksgiving was a wonderful one, and you are, you are just ready to settle in to this season of Advent in the church. Now, I have to, I got to confess that anytime we Anytime we, we recognize these beautiful liturgical seasons in the church, I, I grew up in a church where, um, I mean, up until I got into the United Methodist Church, Lent was just this, this thing you had to pull out in your dryer that collected this stuff. It would burn your house down if you didn't clean it out. And come to find out that there's this beautiful liturgical season leading up to Easter called Lent. So like Lent and Ash Wednesday and Monday Thursday, these were not growing up practices that I celebrated. And the season of Advent, these four Sundays leading up to Christmas Day, like I'm telling you, like faith, it just became so rich for me when I started to look at these seasons and practice them. But I, I, I never... I never want to fully assume that everybody were like, welcome to Advent. And somebody, you know, like you may have been like me over 25 years ago. I'm like, thank you. I don't know what that is. So let me just give you a quick 411 on, on Advent. Advent, um, it's the actually the beginning of the church year. Church year begins with this season of Advent, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. Advent comes from this word Adventus, a Latin word, which means arrival. So during Advent, there's really... We stand between two, two different Advents. During Advent, we always, we look back. That's what we're going to do today. We, we look back at just the state of the world, the condition of the world. What was the world like when God, <laughs> still amazing to me, stepped into the world, took on the, the form of, of a baby and showed us his nature lent us his voice and his wisdom in the person of Jesus. Like, we look back and we're reminded of God coming in. Advent, we always look back. But there's also this reminder in this season that I think is equally as important. We don't always emphasize this as much in the church during Advent. But we also look forward. Because just as, we'll talk about this, just as 2,000 years ago when Jesus came in, the world, <laughs> I mean, it was a dark place. For the children of God, they were really questioning, Lord, have you given up? Are you still here? And God came in. And sometimes, if we're not careful, here in 2021, 2020, 2019, there are things that happen in this world, and we may be questioning, hey, God, just checking, are you still around? Like, are you still here? Are you still for us? Is there still good in the world? So we also look forward. We are reminding ourselves in Advent that just as Jesus came, he also said, oh, by the way, I'm coming again. Like, there is still hope for us in this world today. And, and I say, as long as there's breath in our lungs, there is still a story that he is writing. We have a kingdom to be working on. That's the glory of Advent. So the four Sundays of Advent, there are four candles that you see in our Advent wreath. We lit the first candle today. We've got three other candles. And then on Christmas Eve, the one in the center, the Christ candle. We light the Christ candle on Christmas Eve. And my favorite part, all year long, my favorite, my favorite moment, is when the light jumps from that candle in the center to the pastor's candle 
to those ushers and it spreads out and all of a sudden light just begins to fill a dark space because that's the glory of Advent. So my prayer as you come in this Advent season is just lay all down, like whatever you're carrying, whatever stress, whatever. Advent is a beautiful time to just pause and say, God, what do you have in store for us today? Now, this series, Searching for Christmas, is based off of Isaiah chapter nine. Now, what I love about this church is, you know, we have all of these different expressions of of worship. You've got loft, you've got traditional. We have a campus called Wood Forest, and we're all doing that, searching for Christmas. But see, here's the thing. You got a bunch of creatives that are pastors leading communities. And we all approach scripture, we all approach it differently. So in Harvest, we're going to be focusing on Isaiah chapter 9. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm just going to read this here at the very beginning and give you this picture as to where we're going. And then I'm going to unpack it just a little bit more after a prayer. 700 years before Jesus came into the world, the prophet Isaiah speaks to the children of God who felt like they had blown it, right? There was the Exodus story. They were delivered a promised land, but time and time again, they turned away from God, and they are now out of Jerusalem. They are in Babylonian captivity, and for the second time in the story of God's children, they are captives, and they are not in the promised land. And they're starting to question, Lord, have we blown it? God, are you around? Have we done it? Is God finished with us? And Isaiah preaches this really difficult message, but it's also laced with all of this hope. Because see, they found themselves in a dark time. In Isaiah chapter nine, verse two, he says this, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Say great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Isaiah says, look, I know it seems really dark right now, but there is a light that is on the horizon. There is a light that is coming into the world. He goes further. I'll go to verse six. He says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be Called, and it's right here that Isaiah gives us nine words, four titles of who the Messiah, who the Savior would be. And they are Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So for these next four weeks, what I want to do is, is I want to talk about searching for next week a, a Mighty God searching for an everlasting father, searching for a prince of peace. There are a lot of things I think in our culture today we're searching for, but what I love about the Advent stories when we're searching, we have a God who stepped in and found us. Today, searching for a wonderful counselor. When you hear the words wonderful counselor, what does that bring to mind? You know, we all, like in, in, our, in our language, in our English in 2021, we hear these words and we kind of go, okay, I know what that means. But what I love to do is I love to go back to the original language. What I want to do with you today is this is what the Lord did with me. I, I wanted to run pretty fast, but I felt God just hold on to the back of my jacket and say, well, just, just, just slow down, camp out with two words, wonderful and counselor. So I want to look at 2,700 years ago when Isaiah, when he said, hey, a wonderful counselor is coming, what would the children of God, what would those words actually mean? And then, as I, as I love to do, as I teach, um, you know, I love what did it mean then, but where is the application? What do we do with a wonderful counselor who is searching for us today? So knowing that, will you allow me just to pray before we go a little bit deeper in this word? Just join me in prayer. Father, um, I just thank you so much for, um, just for this day, I just got in the car and, and, and drove to church this morning and it was just misty and, and it was cloudy and it was wet and it was damp. And, and Father, I, I just I got out of the car and I just walked into this church and just thinking, oh, what a dreary day. But then that reminder, and I think it was the Holy Spirit that said, yeah, m- maybe it's dreary, but above those clouds, there's a sun. Above those clouds, there, there, there is a, a blue sky. And, and what was necessary this morning, God, I'm so thankful that, 
for that reminder. Just, I just needed to lift my head and be reminded that no matter the heaviness that we feel, no matter um, the mist that we endure, when life just seems confusing and, and hazy, it doesn't mean that your distant advent is this beautiful season where we're reminded that you are closer in the midst of chaos than you have ever been. You haven't gone anywhere. Advent is a season where we just stop and we just lift our eyes and say, oh, there you are. So God, I pray over those that are inside this space today, those who are here in this room right now. But Father, I also recognize there are people that are watching online, both here in the woodlands, just around the world. And God, I don't know the, the state of everyone's heart, but you do. So Holy Spirit, I would just ask in your power that if there are hearts that are just bound up, anxiety, worry, fear, I would just pray that there would be freedom today as we just experience the wonderful counselor who meets us on this day. Lord, we love you, we thank you. Speak through me, if not through me, in spite of me, so that your will and your words can be heard. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen. You know, I, was, um, I saw a news story this week that I want to show you a little clip of here in just a moment. But when I saw this news story, when I came across it this week, it, it just it made me think about the wonder of children. Right, you, you never really have to urge your kids to be creative. I mean, they're, they're just, they're, they're creative. And, and I don't know if your kids were anything like my kids, but when my kids were little, when I couldn't see them and they were quiet, I got worried. Anybody have those kids? Like, I mean, I could just go on and on and on with stories. Like my son, Nick, who, by the way, as he was just like growing up and rah, 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 all over the place and wouldn't sit still, I still remember this smile of just delight that my mother had because I got one of me. She was so thrilled about that. Grandparents are like that. And then they change and start giving your kids sugar that you never, I don't, that's a different story. But my son, Nick, he got really, really quiet. We got a little worried. It had been too long, and my wife looks at me, and she says, we should probably check on him. We haven't heard anything. And I said, I was thinking the same thing. And we go back into his room, and to our shock and dismay, here's what we found. He had found a black Sharpie permanent marker. He had, no, no, wait, it gets better, completely disrobed, took every stitch of clothing off of his body, and just colored himself all over inside the nose, inside the ears. That child was meticulous. And we said, um, hey buddy, what's going on? And he was so confident. He pointed, we had this little black cat named Charlie. He said, dad, I just wanna be like Charlie. I said, okay, that's so sweet. My daughter Gabby, Gabby, same thing, got quiet. And all of a sudden we hear Nick just scream holy terror. And he comes running out of his room and he says, Gabby killed my fish. And we're like, what on earth? And we ran into his room, and Gabby's in the corner. Nicholas had this little aquarium, little, little aquarium. There were three goldfish. And Gabby, bless her heart, um, she's always just had this big heart for other people. And Nicholas had this bookshelf. You know those thick cardboard books? Like, he had Mr. Brown can moo a whole collection of Seuss books. Well, Gabby, bless her, pulled all those books out and shoved them inside the aquarium, every one of them. And they had swollen, let me tell you, they were so puffy, I walked in, I literally saw a goldfish just like looking up like this, going, I got no room, bro. And I'm like, Gabby, what are you, why would you do this? And she said, well, the fish just wanted to read. They were bored, Dad. So sweet, right? So sweet. Um, what do you do with that? What do you do with all of this wonder? And, and this is the new story that I, I saw. There was a couple, and they're big University of Utah football fans, apparently, and their parents had purchased for them season tickets to the football games. So what they were doing was they were saving up money. They had literally saved up $1,060. They were saving up cash, Dave Ramsey style, in an envelope to give back to mom and dad. And all of a sudden, the envelope turns up missing. The couple goes crazy. They're searching the house, and they finally discovered what happened. Watch this short little clip right here, and you'll see. I'm out digging through the trash, and she hollers and says, I found it. She's holding this shredder, and she says, I think the money is in here. We started laughing. We were just baffled that this could happen. And I just, cried for a minute. <laughs> we can't say we just laughed. A few tears and then a bunch of laughs. The evidence is still right there on the table. I know there's $700 bills. So I guess that kind of helps. And they might get it all back. It turns out there's a government department dedicated to mutilated cash. He said, bag it up, little Ziploc bags, mail it to D.C., 
and between one and two years, you'll get your money back. <laughs> you did that. Wow. <laughs> you shredded all that money. Yeah. First off, there's a parenting issue there. Like, I don't know, I'd be like, look at what you did. <laughs> Isn't that funny? No, 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 no. Um, okay, here's the shocker for me. Like, there is a department in the treasury where some poor souls, their only job is to, they got two years to do it apparently, to tape together damaged and shred money. If you don't have anyone else to pray for this week, just pray for those souls. You know, I, I watch that, and, and here's, here's where my crazy creative mind goes. That's not a bad description for what Advent is all about. <laughs> It's not. Because no matter how damaged, no matter how damaged your, your life, no matter how damaged our world may be, Advent is this reminder that Jesus came into the world to take that which is broken, to take that which is just shredded and beyond repair because of what Jesus has done for us all through the cross, that there is beauty in the midst of brokenness. Listen, that's the glory of Advent that meets us here. That is the wonderful counselor that we're looking at today. So what is a wonderful counselor? Now, every time I, I dive into the, the word, what I love is that I always, like I feel like God always, there's an aha, there's something new that I learn every time. I love it so much. And one of my biggest ahas actually was such a blessing to me. And here's why. Because early on when I, when I, when I was in college, I, I went to East Texas Baptist University and I was, you know, I started, I was a, a radio disc jockey for a, a period of time. To this day, uh, my wife will call and I'll be like, hi honey, how are you? She's like, stop talking in that voice. I'm like, I'm so sorry. So I was a narrator for a Christmas musical that was happening at the college. And I still remember this to this day. There was a portion I was reading from Isaiah 9, and it was a rehearsal for the big production that was going to happen at the cap, in the campus chapel. And I was saying, I was reading from Isaiah 9, 6, and I said, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Oh my, and, and all of a sudden this professor gets up on the stage. Stop, stop, everything stopped. And he walks over to me and he says, Look, do you see a comma? And I said, I'm, I'm sorry. He said, do you see a comma? And I, and I, I looked. I said, we're, like, where specifically? And he said, wonderful counselor, do you see a comma there? And I, and I said, oh, no, you know, I don't. He said, then don't put a comma there. It's one word, wonderful counselor. Okay. So, like, literally, to this day, like, when I'm just reading it out loud, and he shall be called wonderful counselor, Almighty God, like I'm just like, I felt like I let the Lord down. So here's, here's what I found. Are you ready? This is so good. Are you ready? You're not ready. Okay, she is ready. In the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, I look at it, there's a comma between wonderful and counselor. And I'm like, God, you're so faithful, you're so good. And I went to my wife, I said, what was that professor's name? We couldn't remember it. I just wanted to call him 25 years later and share this news. I felt like the Lord probably withheld that name because my spirit was probably not that of God. There's a comma. Now, when you're reading it, well, some of you, like especially King Jamesers, you're like, whoa, 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 did King James get it wrong? Well, calm down, take a breath. <laughs> because actually there isn't a comma between wonderful and counselor. Why? Here's why. Because when I was digging into it this week, wonderful and counselor had two completely different meanings. The Israelites, as, as, as Isaiah was saying, wonderful counselor, they would have heard two different things. But the beauty of Jesus, which is who this is about, is these two beautiful things are found in one person, in one child that we look back and remember on Christmas Eve. So what is wonderful? Wonderful, by definition, in the Hebrew, Pele, I, I love that there's a Hebrew word that you don't spit when you say it out loud. Pele, that's, that's a gift. Wonderful means extraordinarily good or great, causing marvel. It's one of the meanings. But here's what I love. You know what the primary meaning of wonderful is? It's this. It's reserved for acts of God. 
It's reserved for acts of God. So there was only one time that you would use the word wonderful, and it's this, whenever you saw God show up and show off. Anybody remember The Prince of Egypt? Anybody remember that movie, the DreamWorks movie? Y'all, it's still to this day, it's one of my top five favorite films. I remember sitting in that theater. You remember, like, I, I've always just associated with Moses, just stumbling along, trying to figure life out, burning bush, go to Pharaoh, set my people free, and he goes, has those conversations with Pharaoh, all those awkward plagues, those things happen, and what happens? Pharaoh cries uncle. He's just like, take him, set him free, let him go. And the children of God who've been in captivity because God is faithful, they found freedom, but Moses gets to the edge of the Red Sea. You know the story. And Pharaoh changes his mind, and here come the soldiers and standing between a Red Sea, and Pharaoh and his soldiers are a bunch of Israelites looking at Moses, going, are you kidding me? This is how the story ends. And there's just something about the Prince of Egypt, the way that you just see Moses' face, you just see his face, and he looks forward, he takes a deep breath, and he just remembers those words, with this staff, you will do my wonders. And he puts that staff down, you remember? And what happens? The water just separates. It's incredible. The hands of God would actually reach in and would fold the water back. And the Israelites would walk through the sea on dry ground. That, that scene gives me chills every time. That scene where they're walking and you just hear these whale noises and you just see on either side there are fish that are following them. And when they saw that moment on the other side, do you know what they said? Wonderful. That's wonderful. I think about... Um, Joshua, Joshua is, is fighting this battle and, and, and he wants to finish the battle well and he has the audacity to look at God and say, hey God, could you just stop the sun temporarily? Would you just mind putting your fingers and just stopping the sun so I can finish fighting well for you? And, and God, what I love about God, he's up for a challenge. He says, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. And it just holds it. Holds it in place. And an hour turns into two hours, turns into three hours, and the people of God go two things. They go, one, wow, this is the longest day in history. And two, they go, wow, that, that's, that's wonderful, wonderful. So when Isaiah says, hey, someone is coming, and he will be called wonderful, there's a breath there because they already knew that it would be a miraculous act of God when the Savior came in. I have to ask this question. Have we lost our wonder? I mean, have we lost our wonder? Like, this happens all the time. People come up to me and they say, preacher, I just, why doesn't, why doesn't God do miracles anymore? Like, why, 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 don't, like, why don't we see the, the, you know, the miracles? Why don't we see miracles today? And they just keep saying miracles. And, and if you ask me, I'm gonna say the same thing. I'm always like, huh, yeah, did you wake up this morning? Just a quick question. Hey, did you, it's a miracle. Did you, did you see the, did you see the, the, the sun? Did you see, did you see the sun rise? I mean, did you, did you see the faces of these children? Did you, I just think miracles are all around us. The question is, have we lost the wonder of who God is and what he has done for us on a daily basis. Maybe this is why Paul says, whatever is good, excellent, praiseworthy, trustworthy, think about such things. Why? Because it opens our eyes to the wonder of the creator who is showing up and showing off every single day. It's happening all around us. Anne Lamott has this beautiful quote. It's a book that she wrote called Help Thanks Wow about prayer. And she talks about, you know, deep, deep within us, we all have, have you ever just been in a, a moment where you just went, wow? Well, this is what she says, wow, it is often offered with a gasp, a sharp intake of breath when we can't think of another way to capture the sight of shocking beauty or destruction, of a revealed insight or an unexpected flash of grace. Wow means that we are not dulled to wonder. We click into being fully present in that moment when we're stunned into that gasp. Wow is about having one's mind blown by the mesmerizing of the miraculous. What I want you to get on this first Sunday of Advent is this. Advent is a season 
of wow. Advent is a season of wonder. Why? Because the wonderful counselor has stepped in. I have to tell you, the more I spend time with Jesus, the more I spend time growing in my relationship with him, it's impossible to look at Jesus and be bored. I just got to tell you, like it's so hard to look at Jesus and be bored. Why? Because he is wonderful in all of his ways. He is wonderful, but he is also, he is also a counselor. Counselor. The Hebrew definition there is this, full of wisdom or an advocate. Full of wisdom, yes. We'll talk about that. But also an advocate, what they would have heard, a counselor Wonderful, the acts of God, the movements of God, but, but a counselor, but wait a minute, when you go to court, you got a counselor, right? Who is defending someone, and he's standing between a jury and the one he's defending, that's what a counselor would do. He's an advocate, so Jesus would not only be wonderful, perform incredible acts of God, but this is why you would see him with the least and the lost, with the outcasts, full of wisdom, The mind of God, the words of God in the person of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 11, two chapters later, it would put a little more flesh on the wonderful counselor. He'd say the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The apostle Paul in the New Testament, just I love how they tried to just put Meaning, like how can we describe who Jesus is? And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.24 says, Christ, he's both the power of God and the wisdom of God. And the wonderful counselor, he would come in. And of course he would, like God would speak to Mary and God would speak to Joseph and we're gonna go a little deeper in those stories in the week that follow. But have you ever thought about when God truly launches this news? on a bigger scene, who he chose to talk to, who he broke the news to, how he would let the world know that this has happened. He didn't go to a priest. He didn't go to a senior pastor of a church. He didn't even go to a prophet. He released the news to shepherds. I love this so much. Shepherds, outcasts. Nomads. Do you know shepherds, because they, because they worked with sheep, were considered to be dirty. They were defiled. Like they weren't even allowed to go into the church. Shepherds. And God would look at these people and go, they're the ones. That's where my word is coming in. So here's the wonder found in the wonderful counselor when the shepherds are minding their business in darkness, tending to their sheep, you know, and an angel would step in and say, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy and it will be for who? All the people. There's good news today. We are a people who are a people of good news. There's great joy today. Why? We are a people filled with great joy, and it is for all people. We should be a people who are for all people. Why? Because that's who our wonderful counselor came to serve. It's just incredible. Good news of great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. And this is a sign to you. You're gonna find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And I just love this one angel and the rest of the angels who'd been leaning in ever since like Genesis 3 in the very beginning when Adam and Eve messed it up. And Genesis 3 says that someone is coming that's going to defeat the darkness. The enemy doesn't get the last word. And I just think the angels are just going, God, what are you gonna do? Like, what's your plan? And all of a sudden, the word is there, and one angel pulls the short straw and gets to tell the story. But I just love the rest of the angels are leaning in, going, we gotta sing, we gotta sing. And God says, you just go on and sing. And where it started with do not be afraid, all of a sudden I think sheer terror broke out because suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, let's say it together, glory to God in the highest heaven 
and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. <laughs> Clap off. Darkness. And the shepherds go, hey, we better go check this thing out, right? And what do they do? I don't know why they sounded like Gomer Pyle. That's weird. But the shepherds, some of you older ones, younger ones, Google it. Um, they go. And the wonderful counselor enters onto the scene. See, that's the joy. That's the beauty. That's the wonder found in the wonderful counselor. So I don't know what you're searching for today. I don't know what you're looking for today. But here's what the wonderful counselor, what, what I believe the wonderful counselor would have you know on this particular day, at this particular moment, that whatever you're going through, you need to know that he understands. He understands. He understands the struggle. He understands the fear. He understands the worry. The writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one, I would say, a wonderful counselor who's been tempted in every way just as we are. Here's the thing, he didn't sin. So let's approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, there was a time in Isaiah's day that the only one who could come into the presence of a holy God was the priest. But when Jesus came into the world, it changed everything because of what he did because he took on the sins of humanity, because he went to that cross. Listen, we have direct access. The writer of Hebrews says, isn't it wonderful that because of a wonderful counselor, we can come and approach God's throne with confidence, knowing that Jesus hears us, that he is for us. You need to know someone right now. You think he doesn't know. You think he doesn't know the heartache. You, you've been trying to have this one thing happen for a long time, and it's breaking you. I see your face right now. You need to know this. He understands. He understands. But secondly, and, and lastly, this, oh, this message just came so clear to me. You need to know that he cares. He cares. Isn't it good to know that we have a wonderful counselor who cares when we're struggling, when we're just dealing with difficulty, when you feel like you, you can't breathe, that he cares. First Peter 5, 7, I know it by heart, says this, cast all of your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, the wonderful counselor would look and he would say, come to me if you're weary and you're burdened and I will give you, what's that word? Rest. rest. I'll give you rest. In this season of Advent, we're faster, do more, do more things, get all of this done. Jesus says, no, 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 just find rest. That's what I want to give you this Advent season. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For here's his nature. He says, I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find, say it again, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Church, put a breath between wonderful and counselor. Let me give you permission. I'm so rebellious like that. Take a breath. It's okay. Because he is wonderful. He's working. And he is a counselor. Listen, free of charge. Cheapest counseling you will ever get. Found in the red letters of the gospel. There's something that he wants to share with you. Last thing I'll share is, is this. It's um, anybody familiar with the TikTok? Yeah. <laughs> I'm super relevant right now. No, it's, uh, there was a video that went viral on, on TikTok, and um, it was, uh, I think it was staged, but I, I like the kind of the heart of what it was about. Apparently, he was a teacher, and this is just how he, he starts this particular semester, and he's looking at, I think they're like math students, and he, he's teaching them a lesson. He holds out a cup of water, and he says, let me ask you, somebody tell me, how much does this weigh? How much does it weigh? And he waits, and kids start guessing, eight ounces. And he says, nope, it's not right. Someone said 10 ounces. He said, nope, nope, that's not it. Someone said 12 ounces. He said, no. And they finally get tired of guessing. And he said, I want to tell you that the weight is completely insignificant. It's irrelevant. But here's the thing. It's, it's how you hold it. That's the, that's the deeper question. He said, you know, this glass of water right here, no matter the weight, the truth is after, you know, five minutes, it's fine. But after an hour, my arm is going to start to ache a little bit. After about five hours, what's going to happen is this arm is going to start to cramp up. And he said, after 12 hours, 100% chance that this arm 
holding this out, whether it's eight, 10, 12 ounces, it's gonna go completely numb. So he said, here's the thing that you have to do with it. You gotta put it down. And here's where this geometry teacher just started preaching. He said, here's the thing you need to yo young, young people. He said, the thing is, how are you carrying your load? What are you doing with anxiety? What are you doing with weight? What are you doing with hurt? What are you doing with the things that you're carrying into the semester? Because the truth is, you may think you're carrying it fine, and for a period of time, maybe you can, but eventually, if you're not careful, if you don't do something about the load that you have on your shoulders, what's gonna happen is you're gonna start to ache. Some of you are aching in this place today, emotionally, spiritually. He said, after an extended period of time, you could go completely numb. Some of you, maybe you're there. Here's what the wonderful counselor says. You just heard it, Matthew 11, 1 Peter. Just put it down. So the good news this Advent, I'm not giving you a list of things to do for God this week. I'm not gonna do it. I want you to just revel in what he has done for you. Let me pray. God, I thank you so much for this word. Oh, Lord, I thank you that just two words, that's it, two words, wonderful counselor can bring so much truth, so much healing as we begin this Advent journey together. So Lord, I just pray that these words today, God, that they would just wrap around hearts. There's freedom that's being found in this space online. There's freedom today that's being found, but God, it's too good to leave here. So Lord, I just pray that as we continue to move forward next week, as we look at mighty God, what does a mighty God do for us? That you would just continue to bring to life this beautiful picture of who you are and what you've done for us all through Jesus. We love you, Father. We thank you, and it's in your name that we say amen.